Let me introduce you to uh, Jolene McKee, author of So You've Registered, What Now? Studied nursing at Ulster University in Northern Ireland and is currently working as a nurse development lead in Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. Jolene has experience working in clinical research, ophthalmology and cardiothoracic surgery. Jolene was awarded the Learning in Practice Award at the Royal College of Nursing's Nurse of Year Awards in Northern Ireland for her work with students and newly registered nurses in her area. And Jolene is also currently an RCN Learning Representative. Next, we have uh, Professor Joy Notter, co-author of Handbook for Registered Nurses, is a professor of community health care at Birmingham City University and Professor Honoris Causa Hanoi Medical University, Vietnam. Having trained as a nurse at St. Thomas's, Joy, has, um, Joy also trained as a health visitor before gaining her master's and subsequent PhD. She has had the most amazing career. Her research includes recruitment and retention of BAME staff in the NHS, palliative care, the impact of chronic illness on quality of life, evaluation of loss and grief training and community self-help with AIDS in Kenya. She has worked internationally in capacity building and nursing in Vietnam, Ukraine, Romania and Moldova. She is involved in enhancing expertise in wound care in Vietnam and raising the level of critical care nursing in Zambia and was grant holder for a UKRI Newton Agile response project to address short, medium and long term response to COVID-19. Professor Notter is joined by her co-author, Major Chris Carter, uh, an Associate Professor at Birmingham City University and an experienced critical care nurse and leader. During the first wave of COVID-19, Chris was seconded to a London hospital as a matron for critical care. For the remainder of the pandemic, he was project manager, maintaining an in-country presence in Zambia on a UK RI Newton Agile Response Research Project to COVID-19 helping with short, medium and long-term response to COVID-19. He was lead author on one of, of the first COVID-19 critical care textbooks, COVID-19, a critical care textbook by Elsevier. Chris has worked in a variety of trauma and critical care settings, including Afghanistan and Oman. Chris is leading projects in Zambia and Malawi and is supporting projects in Vietnam, Somaliland and Jamaica. He has, he has lectured on critical care in China and is a visiting professor there. And lastly, uh, but not least, we want to introduce Dr. Kirsty, Kirsty Marshall, a senior lecturer in integrated care and specialist community practice, working at the University of Salford and is co-author of Demystifying Integrated Care. Kirsty has previous experience as a strategic and operational manager and clinical leader within the NHS. Her clinical background is community and district nursing, and she also worked in a national role as Productive Ward Facilitator for the NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement. Kirsty completed her professional doctorate in 2020, and the research area looks at the impact of integration on staff within community services and patient experience of integration, other interests, international and global nursing. A huge thank you to you all, honestly. Uh, to all of the authors for taking the time out of their busy schedule to be with us today. And without further ado, I would like to open up today's session by handing over to Jolene McKee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking Elsevier for inviting me to this event um, as a new author. I'm really happy to be here, but also a little nervous to join such an amazing panel. Firstly, to introduce myself, as uh, Natalie said, my name is Jolene and I'm a registered nurse from Belfast and my book is called So You've Registered, What Now? The idea behind the target market and people who had, or people who had the same experience as me, you aspired to become a nurse, you got your pin, and then there's that, oh my God, moment when you realise this is actually real. And we've all been there. You work so hard and then comes the deer in the headlights moment when responsibility becomes a reality. The long days seem never ending and the stress feels like a burden when you go home at night wondering if you actually did make a difference. When I started out, nursing wasn't even on the radar for me. I thought I was going to be a journalist and had this life of living in Manhattan and working for the New York Times. You know, Carrie from Sex and the City, well, that was going to be me. I even had a degree in media studies before nursing came calling. So thank you, Elsevier, for making the dream of becoming a writer work out in the end. Everyone comes into nursing for different reasons, and my reason was my dad. I was volunteering for St John Ambulance when he took seriously ill one night and I had to spring into action. 
from that moment, I knew that being a nurse was never going to be a choice for me. It's what I had to do and it was part of who I am. It just took that moment for everything to click. So I studied at Ulster University, got my pin, the blue tunic, the pens neatly lined up in my pocket and I started life as a cardiothoracic surgery nurse. And for those of you who know that area, it's pretty intense, a tough environment for any nurse, not least a newbie. With really sick patients, I saw it all. Sad tears, happy tears, and moments my own heart skipped a beat and my own breath was taken away. However, during my time working there, I seen the best in nursing. The team I worked with were like no other, and it was clear that our patients and their families were grateful that we were there for them and their loved ones in their darkest hours. But that type of work can drain you. It can give you sleepless nights, and after 13 hour days, many that are longer, it can affect your life, it can affect your relationships. You know you're doing the right thing, but at what cost? This is a big part of my book, which I'll talk about in a moment. From cardiothoracics, I had stints in surgical pre-assessment, ophthalmology, clinical research, including diabetes research, acute stroke research, and even trials for COVID-19 treatments. I'm now a nurse development lead and unscheduled care, and I absolutely love it. However, this is a career that I never really thought that I would reach so soon. It was never really on my radar. I always wanted to be an emergency nurse practitioner, you know, to sprint into action when someone took really sick. But it just goes to show how, how you can change your mind and how diverse nursing is and how many avenues and options we have. We never have to stay anywhere for too long. We can dream to be a cardiac nurse one day and a few months later want to specialise in something completely different. You can even uproot yourself to the far ends of the earth, work in a hospital set in a clinic, the boot of your car, a cruise ship and even an aeroplane. We can be nurses in so many different settings and we don so many different hats. Nursing really is a passport to the world, but also a passport to so many exciting experiences and opportunities. Okay, so enough about me. What about the book? So You Registered What Now is not meant to be a textbook and it's not an encyclopedia about nursing. I'm not going to give you all of the answers and I always wanted it to be a pick me up when you need me kind of book. Something that makes you think and reflect. It takes you through the nursing journey from how to land the job, what you need to know on your first day, there's hints and tips about interview techniques and how to approach difficult conversations and raise concerns if you see bad practice. It's also packed with case studies from real nurses, including some who talk very frankly about their deepest fears of getting things wrong and also nurses who worked during the pandemic with some incredible experiences to share what they think we could do differently. My book is aimed at everyone. However, there is a particular focus for student nurses, newly registered nurses and international nurses coming to work in the UK for the first time and nursing associates. In the book, we discuss things such as leadership, management and accountability. So it really does offer something for everyone. It may guide you through the processes such as applying for a job, preparing for the interview or deciding where to work or understanding what type of nurse you want to be. It may also simply offer just a refresher on things like reflection and revalidation, or maybe just it's a voice of a friend that's trying to encourage you to keep you going. And that's why I've tried to write this book. I was motivated to write because I took experiences from my own nursing journey. And to be honest, at times I bottled things up and shied away from having conversations that I didn't want to have. But by being more open and talking to others about these experiences, I realized that most nurses are all in the same boat. We've all had similar experiences and we all have those similar voices in our, in our heads telling us that we can't do this, we aren't good enough, but we're not robots. And you can't be when you're dealing with humanity, it's most vulnerable. I wanted to write down my experiences and share them. And I found with every nurse I spoke to, whether it was for research for this book or those who feature, we all have a story to share. And in chapter one, and in So the Journey Begins, I talk about starting a new job and how it can be frustrating for anyone. But as a student nurse, you get used to being new. You're the outsider, the one who has to get to grips with things quickly. It's sink or swim. And on the one hand, that is good preparation and it allows you to adapt to your new surroundings. But when it's your permanent post, that job that you've worked so hard for throughout your training, it can feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders because if it doesn't work out, what then? My book talks about how to start off in the right foot. Even the little details such as getting yourself into your routine and sussing out who does what and why is a first protocol. It also explores what I call in the book as, and don't laugh, nurse brain. I can't claim credit for this. This is a, a word that my fiance calls me, it says to me all of the time. Basically, he says that we nurses think differently to non-nursing individuals. We're like the unofficial detectives. 
To most people, the guy walking past you in Tesco just looks like he's really sunburnt. But to us, we're looking at him thinking, whoa, his blood pressure must be through the roof. Or when we hear someone struggling in a restaurant, you're trying to have a romantic meal, but in the back of your head, all you're thinking is that person's starting to choke and you're nearly half out of your chair ready to act. It's like we can never switch off. It's like that saying, is there a medic on board? We're never really off duty, are we? This book discusses this. We walk through nurse brain, nurse instinct and our overactive, unswitchable minds. But we also work through how we can separate our nurse self from our actual selves. And it's important in any job to take downtime and have a personal have personal space. And I believe in healthcare, this is more important to master. In this book, I give you hints and tips on how to achieve and balance both sides of your personality, the nurse you and the simply just you. I wrote this book with the mentality that I didn't want to give you extra work or any more intense reading, but rather I wanted to create something that felt safe. A space where you could uncover your emotions after a hard day and try to make sense of what happened. I wanted to share my experiences of battling my way through my early career and what helped me and other nurses I spoke to when creating this work. Their case studies are reflected in my words. And if you want to, they can be reflected in your words also. In the book, there's space for you to become part of the story, to write down your thoughts and feelings and experiences and reflect on your practice, to uncover how you feel you're really doing and what you could do better next time, or simply just to give yourself that little boost and a pat on the back. To speak to the per to speak to <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I wanted this book to be interactive through the pages and to speak to you on a personal and individualized level and allow you to become part of my journey and the journey of the nurses featured. Nursing is known to be a family after all, and I wanted my readers to feel that sense of inclusion and psychological safety. This book offers an insight into leadership styles, real life experiences of nurses who have had the good and not so good leaders, and what actions they took when things were not going well and bullying and harassment came to their door. We explore our accountability as nurses and how under our code of conduct, we're responsible for our acts and omissions and how this can influence and shape our practice and our relationship with our colleagues. Of course, no book would be complete without a chapter dedicated to reflection. In a sense, talking about reflection is where my journey to becoming an author began for me. I was an RCN student at Congress in Glasgow a few years ago and I was speaking on a panel about reflection and how to do this professionally. This is where my journey for Elsevier began and I've gone from being a nerdy book lover as a kid to having my own book on sale in stores. I can't tell you how cool that feels. It just goes to show you that once again you can do so much with this incredible profession and even achieve a once in a lifetime dream of becoming a published writer. I'd like to thank everyone for listening for the last 10 minutes and I hope I haven't bored you too much um, but I do hope my book offers you something even if, it's just, even if it's just to know that you're not alone. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much Jolene, really appreciate that. Uh, so next we have uh, Chris Carter and Professor Joy Notter and um, would love to invite you to talk about your book. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am uh, Chris Carter, and I'm joining at the moment from um, Lusaka, Zambia, so Central Southern Africa. So um, I am hoping that my internet holds and that um, I'm coming across clear. Um, if not, Joy is poised, ready to take over um, and um, and take us through this, ses this session. <laughs> Um, so firstly, thank you for inviting us um, to talk about um, our new book, the um, Handbook for Registered Nurses Essential Skills book. Um, this is a new edition um, which was updated from uh, a previous book called The Essential Skills for Nurses, which had been um, part of El Elsevier's book range for um, a number of years. Um, and the book, so Joy and myself edited the book, but we had contributors um, from different universities. Um, and so we had um, mainly from uh, King's College London. So I thought what we'd do is we'd maybe just talk about our contributors a little bit more about us, and then we'll talk a little, a little bit more about the book. Um, so Joy, do you want to go first? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, I'm delighted to be with you. Um, I am in the UK still, although I will be joining Chris out in August out there. Um, and you, well, you've heard our backgrounds. We're an unusual combination, but that's why it works because we bring very different nursing skills together. And we've now worked together for what, eight years, Chris? And written together, I think something like that. And it's the combination of things we can bring 
and we have very similar ideas. We, we're both committed to nursing and want to see nursing continue to flourish. And so I was delighted to have the opportunity to join in this book, but I think Chris is going to say a little bit about the other authors and then probably um, lead, lead us through. I'm happy to join in at any point, but with only 10 minutes, I think it's better if Chris then introduces himself and the rest of the authors, because Chris is the lead editor and, and the rest of us have worked with him. So over to you, Chris. Um, thank you, Joy. Um, what Joy hadn't told you and what didn't come out in her biography was it, this year, Joy celebrated 50 <laughs> years as a, as a nurse. Um, continued service. So, you know, so um, I have to say, you know, a lot of experience has been shared coming from Joy. So, um, uh, and so it's really, it's really humbling actually that we've actually had the opportunity to sort of influence the next generation of nurses, um, hopefully with this book. So as we've said, we've had um, a number of contributors um, that we've worked with. Um, and so we had uh, Dr. Mary Rally, who is an Associate Dean for Practice Learning and Senior Lecturer at King's College um, London. Um, and Mary is a registered nurse and a registered nurse teacher. And she's had uh, over two decades of experience of working in the NHS and before moving into higher education. And she's been the programme lead for the BSc Nursing uh, Pro Adult Nursing Programme at King's at the Florence Nightingale School of Nursing, Midwifery and Palliative Care. Um, her background, um, like mine, is a critical care um, with some acute care. And she's um, uh, worked in a variety of clinical education and organisational skills. Um, her main research interests have been around advanced practice education and an interest in simulation-based um, education into professional learning. Um, so Mary's contribution to the book has really been around making sure that, that student nurses and newly qualified nurses have a good grounding in, in clinical skills that allows them to build and do the decision making with other healthcare professionals and then and then have good a good solid foundation if they go on to do advanced practice. Um, we also had um, Carolyn Stewart, who is a lecturer at King's College London, um, and she's a critical care nurse. And I have to say, a declaration of interest, critical care nurse, they're not trying to dominate this. Um, it's been everywhere. Um, and she's been qualified for over 16 years and worked in different intensive care units um, throughout the UK. Um, Carolyn worked in a, was a uh, for several years was a clinical educator and practice development nurse in a large neuro trauma intensive care unit in London um, and so has a very strong interest in clinical education and currently runs the ICU course um, at King's. And then our final contributor is Sarah Kerr, who was um, a lecturer in nurse education at King's College London. And I actually first met Sarah when she was a student nurse um, a long time ago um, and it was great to see how, she, how her career grew from being a student nurse at King's and then going on to be an emergency nurse and then going into um, higher education. Um, Sarah was committed to um, pre-registration pre nurse education and she was the clinical tutor at King's uh, for many years um, as well as being an experienced emergency nurse. Um, We've, had to, we've dedicated um, this edition of the book to Sarah, um, as she supported the revised edition from the beginning. However, sadly, um, she didn't see it reach publication um, and her commitment to students and colleagues will always be remembered. And so it's important, you know, Sarah made a huge contribution to this book and also touched many of us um, over the years. Um, so I think what you can, see from our backgrounds is that we are experienced nurses um, who have worked in both clinical practice and um, education. So we were hoping we're not just approaching it from like the higher education um, uh, uh, institution. We actually are still in clinical practice. We still see patients. You can see I'm still in my scrubs because I've just come off um, the ICU here in Lusaka. Um, and so we recognise the importance of keeping current, but also um, keeping up with the changes in the healthcare system and keeping up to date with how skills have changed. 
Um, as you know from our from the introduction, um, both Joy and I work internationally. So we have had the opportunity to meet students both pre-registration, post-registration, and um, postgraduate students at all levels in all different healthcare systems. And whilst the education systems are different and the expectations and responsibilities of students vary internationally the one thing that everyone is always focusing on is is how to work in practice those gaining those crucial skills not seeing them as a task how they interlink how 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 we interact how we what we do um our decision making when we need to um do an intervention um so we've taken all this experience as 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 have our contributors and put this into our uh, into this new edition um, and the key message I suppose for us that have had varying lengths of careers is we take, may take things for granted um, and so as the healthcare system changes we automatically adapt with it as new education programs come in we automatically sort of just move with the times but actually for our students often this is the first time that they've undertaken a procedure. So when we're looking at things like a nasogastric tube insertion, um, performing a, a urinary catheter, or doing a wound dressing, these things we may take for granted, but actually for, for our students or newly qualified nurses, this may be the first time that they've actually done this um, unsupervised or you know, for the first time on a, on a, a live patient. Um, so we wanted to sort of make sure that this book um, bridges that bridge that theory practice gap um, so that this, the knowledge and skills that people obtain in universities can then be applied in the clinical practice. So the book very much focuses on the skills that students and newly qualified nurses need, allows them to think about where to start when doing a pre doing a procedure so it's not just how to do the procedure some decision making around why we might be doing this some things that you might need to consider before doing the procedure then running through the steps that need to be carried out in a logical and structured order and then to think about what needs to be done afterwards and so we were keen that this book was a practical based um, handbook not to be a tomb you know a bulky document or a bulky textbook um, that would remain on a shelf um, we wanted it to be used. We wanted the book to be open. We wanted it to be well, you know, leafed through. If it's a if it's a hard copy, or for it to be, you know, an online use that it's it's well used, um, so that people refer to it and um, and go back to it and maybe use it as a guide for teaching other students um, when people go through the system and become qualified staff. Um, so the book is aimed at student nurses about to qualify, um, registered nurses and um, newly qualified who are working in all fields of practice and we've tried to make the book um, reflective of both acute and community and um, Joy has an acute background, I have the uh, acute um the, sorry the community background i have the acute background to so try and harmonize those two together but we also need to recognize that recognition of maybe the deteriorating patient or um doing interventions just doesn't sit in the adult field it actually translates to mental health learning disabilities so there's also um, an importance of um uh, or relevance to other areas of practice um, and also people that might be returning to practice after a period of, um, uh, of not being a registered nurse. Um, we've also tried to put an international flavour in it, so although it's reflective of the NMC, it's reflective of the UK NHS sort of practice areas, we recognise that not everyone practices in that field and also, you know, international students may also find that um, useful. So each of the clinical skills um, it's broken down into systems the chapters are broken uh, the book is broken down into chapters and then we have clinical skills that go from start to finish um, and there's photographs included to help sort of demonstrate some of those pr procedures 
As I've said, it recognises the change in nurse education standards, so particularly around those pre-registration proficiency standards. Um, and it's not just doing a series of skills. We've actually tried to put the clinical decision making in and also about how you might coordinate care. And um, this includes supervision of peers, junior staff, as well as other professional groups. Um, and also the book can be hopefully used as a teaching aid in practice as well. So we're absolutely delighted to see it completed and uh, finally in print. Um, and we hope that people enjoy using the resource. Um, Joy, is there anything you would like to okay. add? Just just a big thank you to Elsevier for supporting it and letting us put it into print, because it's very much part of the way we work and we do want to share it with people. And say to nurses, you will have the confidence and competence but there's something here if you're not sure that you can check as you then move on to carry things out. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much for that. Um, and uh, finally, I'd love to introduce Kirsty Marshall to talk about her book, Mystifying Integrated Care. The first thing to point out was the picture of me it was from a while back, so I look quite different. <laughs> different now not the writing of editing a book ages you in any way um so I want to I suppose start a little bit about I'll talk about myself and the other the editors and then talk a little bit about the format of the book and why why we decided to write it um so to start with I suppose it's for something a little bit different in the sense that this isn't a book solely aimed at nurses although um it's absolutely relevant and um in, uh, crucial for nurses, particularly nurses who are interested in working within the community sector. Um, but it is it is written for anyone within the health and social care and voluntary sector or anyone working across healthcare systems to look at how we change the model and the, the our, our way of thinking around um, healthcare delivery. I would first want to give huge thanks. I'm the, the lead editor. This is the first book I've edited. Um, and a bit, a bit like our first presenter, I, I also wanted to be a writer in my youth. So it is very nice to finally have got something into um, a book into print. Um, so, um, like I said, my name's Kirsty. I'm the lead editor. I am a district nurse by background. I've worked in numerous different roles within the NHS and in national roles as well. And I currently work for the University of Salford, where I've been for the last six years. And I head up the um the um, community specialist practice programs as well as working as being seconded to the national institute for health research looking at research capacity and capability building particularly within community nursing where we know that we don't have as much research activity so i work supporting nurses developing their pre-doctoral and doctoral um, work and across in organizations so i have a, both an nhs role and a university role at the moment. Our second editor is my good friend, Hayley, Dr. Hayley Bamba. She is an occupational therapist by background. Uh, we did our pro professional doctorates together and we've written a lot together around the need for more integrated approaches to healthcare and looking beyond our own professional disciplines. Uh, then we have our, uh, Ruth, Dr. Ruth Garbert, who is our our social worker on, a, on our team. She's the head of social work at the University of Salford and she um, helps us provide balance across that health and social care sector, which is the real kind of areas that we look at within the book, but also she um, challenges and gives us um, different perspectives. And finally, um, Chris Easton, who was uh, at one time my adopted boss. He wasn't my official boss, but I liked him a lot. So I, I, I adopted him. As one of as, as my boss at the time when we worked in healthcare transformation together and we've made remained a uh, good friend since he works in a national role for the for the NHS now and um he is not a nurse or a healthcare practitioner by background at all and which is a really important part of this book he works a lot with charities in the voluntary sector and those outside of what we would consider the tr traditional healthcare services and his his role as the editor was not only to edit but also to ensure that when we talk about integrated care and demystifying integrated care is that we actually use a, a number of different voices and we look at it healthcare from a different perspective. Um, 
so why why this book and why now um integrated care is a growing i mean it's been around for many 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 years but is increasingly becoming an important concept within health and social care because we have an aging population we have massive shifts in demographics and epidemiology um of our of our populations and people are predominantly getting unwell with long-term conditions and we need to look at actually how do we address long-term conditions in a different way how do we transform our systems and the, our ways of working out and our ways of thinking to actually look at people in the whole and support them to live healthier happier lives within within the community setting so it is not it is not a book about how we treat people in hospital or how we work with now, although we do touch on the need to integrate with hospital services, it is a book about how we how we as health and social care professionals can support people to stay healthy and to to get the best out of their lives and how our system needs to transform and um, change. Um, it has we've got over 32 different authors um, in the book. Each chapter is based around a case study. Um, so we, we've brought, um, every chapter has a case study from practice, and then we talk about how, how that case study can be applied in other areas and what were the, the learning from that case study. The book's in five different settings, so it takes you from the theoretical concepts, so things like population health, looking at people, community and place, and that's very much about, we can look at individual health um, and the health of an individual, but we know that for example, in Greater Manchester, where I'm based, um, we have one of the fastest growing economies in the country, yet we also have some of the worst health outcomes in the UK. So what else is going on within in this area that means that people are not having the best and the most healthy lives they can? Why is it that people's healthy life expectancy in some areas of our boroughs are around 58%? This also isn't a problem unique to the northwest of England or England or Great Man um, the UK, it is across the world um, uh, pop where there is a greater focus on population health and actually how we support people to stay healthy. We look at the wider determinants health and health inequalities. These are very big themes across the book and they are part of the principles that integrated care is built on, is that we need to narrow the inequalities that that put challenge onto people's health and support people to gain the most they can out of the healthcare. So we talk about health creation. So that's sort of the wider theoretical. We then move into how our systems um, are formed. So we look across leadership uh, and lead, leadership. And we have a chapter on children and young people with special educational needs. So we look at actually how the education system can support health and well-being for young people, which allows them to go into adulthood and gain um, healthy lives as they get older. Um, we look at governance and accountability and some of the challenges um, when you are changing systems, when you've got um, health, social care, voluntary sector, the community and people uh, involved, how governance needs to support health rather than act as a barrier sometimes. We talk about social prescribing and the need to look broader at the broader causation of issues with health. Um, we then look at organisational influences um, and applications. So we look at managing change, integrated services. Um, we look at strategic approaches, look at how our services are, are coordinated and organised. So some of that is looking at the difference between we talk about co-location, but actually co-location isn't integration. It's just putting people in the same room. So actually, how do you change the way people work, the way people think? So that when we are provide when we are coordinating care for someone, that we are looking at several different issues across the system. For example, if you have someone who has exacerbation of COPD and ends up in A&E, and then they go home, but they go home to a damp house where they, um, with issues, they will be back into hospital. So actually some of those issues need to be dealt with as well. Also, we look at social isolation and the impact of social isolation on health and how you, the use of voluntary sector services, or use, the need to engage in communities is vital to the health of our populations. 
Um, and then we look at our workforce. So how us as practitioners um, work with with our with our, with people with with communities with families. Um, I try and avoid avoid the word patient, um, even though it's sort of is very hard for me as a nurse and having it ingrained in me. I do believe that actually we need to start looking at, at people as people um, in the same way that we are people and try and formulate our approaches based on actually how people as human beings interact with each other. Uh, we look at communication and we look at workforce transformation. Then at part five is, this is one we really let the authors uh, kind of go wild <laughs> in the in part five. It is uh, practical in, practicing integration. So there's some a lot of very personal uh, stories of working within integrated systems or developing integrated systems from our authors, like I say, from across the health, social care and academic sector. Uh, we have um, a, cha a chapter in this uh, by Dr. Claire Brown, who look, talks about understanding the needs of LGBTQ people in integrated care. And she uses examples of fertility treatments and some of the challenges that people um, in those communities face when trying to start a family. Uh, Ruth uh, looks at integration and learning disabilities. We also have a chapter on falls and older adults. So we've got a huge mix of all incredibly talented authors, a really great set of case studies from practice from which that we've at, um, been able to analyze and put the theoretical background to. And it covers a whole breadth of where we're at. Um, where integrated care is now, where we need it to be in the future, and how we can use integrated care as a vehicle for supporting the, the health of populations as a whole and the he health of individuals. I'm not sure how long I've been talking, but I'm guessing I'm up to 10 minutes. Um, so um, that's, that's yeah, I'll stop now. <laughs> but that's us. Um, thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Um, so thank you very much to, to our authors. Uh, just before we move over to Q&A, just a reminder, please put your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Gladys, Gladys Lopez, who is just going to briefly show you where you can access the books if you have subscriptions to certain products from Elsevier and also where you can purchase them. So. Gladys, I will hand over to you. And thank you so much, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. And I want to quickly let you know how you can access the books that our speakers have just presented. You might have been wondering where should I find it, and I want to read it right now. So for you to know, they will be made available for sales as a hard copy, but you might have access already, actually, uh, through Clinical Key for Nursing or Clinical Key Student Nursing. Uh, the access might have run through your institution, so it's worth after a webinar to check it out if you can access to this platform. We will share the link to them at the end of the webinar and also via email afterwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Clinical Key Nursing Solution Tools offer you the ability to access books as well as other content types quickly and easily and support you in any stage of your career. You can see here in the screen that Clinical Key Student Nursing is for pre-registration nurses and is a learning platform that take you through the start until the end of your studies. You can see here that you can go through the book site and when you click on the books, you are going to be able to actually log in into your personal account if you have a personal account and then have the list of the books that you might like to explore. In this case, uh, we can also check it out, uh, the handbook for registered nurses that is it has been presented from Major Chris Carter and Professor jo Joy Nutter. And of course, you can explore other type of, of content as well. But as we have just heard, this was a really nice opportunity to show this one. And then a clinical key for nursing is um, aimed at post-registration nurses and provides evidence-based information so you are better equipped to answer complex questions about patients' conditions. You can see here that it's not only books and journals, you can have also point-of-care tools like clinical overviews or mostly evidence-based nursing monographs or patient education in different languages. 
And here we're gonna see the book uh, that, that we have been highlighting from one of our authors. And here you can ha have the, so you have register, what now? from um, Jolene Maki. And uh, you can see that you can also explore the content there, go chapter by chapter, also save the chapter if you have a personal account. Uh, so then it's easily, easily accessible afterwards. Also here we are highlighting the mystifying, the mystifying integrated care that we have just heard from Kirsty Marshall. And this is the other way that you can order in case that you can have access to clinical key student nursing or clinical key for nursing. So this is a short demo. Any other question you might have, feel free to reach out to us and we are going to let you know if you have access or not or what are your options to, to reach out this content. So back to you, Natalie. I think it's the time for Q&A. Yes, thank you so much, Gladys, uh, for running through that. Um, so bear with me. I'd love to invite um, our authors to jump on the camera if you're able to. Um, and I'll have a look at the Q&A. My apologies, I haven't looked at it before because I've been running the uh, webinar. But let's see. So uh, uh, this is uh, one for, from uh, one of our um, participants, probably for, for everybody, actually, as aspiring authors, current lecturers, what support did the authors get from Elsevier throughout the process from idea to publishing? So this is probably to all of you to be able to share your views. Um, I can start. Um, <laughs> so I we've got I would say probably, uh, hopefully for the, the, the other authors as well, we're speaking for myself, we've got a huge amount of support right from the beginning of the process when we were talking about what the book's content should be, what the focus should be, um, how we're going to, how we're going to formulate the book, being able to share those ideas and test some of the ideas because I was it was my first editing experience on a book. Um, most of my other writing experience had been for journal articles, which were a much smaller scale um, in, in lots of respect. I was really keen that we had lots of different authors and lots of things. And um, <laughs> the Elsevier, I'd say, were very good at explaining to me the difficulties, but the advantages of doing that and what my role as the editor was within that. So I worked with Robert a lot on that before we even started putting sort of pen to paper kind of bit of it, of making sure that we'd set the right ideas and setting timescales. And then we had a lot of creative freedom on what we wanted to do, where we got the authors. We then worked with the editorial team over at Elsevier with Sophie, who is amazing, and we um, put up with endless, endless, endless corrections and working together. And that was a really important part of it, of testing it and getting out, getting the chapters right and getting them looking right and getting them feeling right and making sure that there was consistency and quality across the whole book. So I think that was really, really nice. But without also taking away the editorial and the authorship from us as and in it. Um, so I found it a very uh, supportive, creative relationship. And then um, right down to then picking the style, styles of the book and the front cover. And probably that was where I probably drove Elsevier the most mad on the cover of my book, <laughs> repeatedly sending back wanting different pictures because I had a very clear idea in my head what the cover should look like um, and why. Why? So um, the, on our book, the cover is it's, they're birch trees, which is a sign of renewal um, and um, thing. And I had this picture in my head of what I wanted. So <laughs> Elsevier were brilliant at doing that. Um, but also with all the, the fiddly little things that you don't think about, around getting permissions and making sure that all things and having that expert advice that you could go to all the time to make sure that you were on track. And that's, that's the last bit they were really good at is keeping me on track um, and reminding me of the deadlines that we had and supporting me when we had to sort of encourage authors with deadlines. Um, and that, yes, yeah, so that's, I suppose, for me, those were the main key points of the support we got with Elsevier. Well, thank you. I don't know if anybody else has any comments um, with regards to that. But think, it's okay think, can I just second some of those comments? We got, every time we emailed with a query, they were very supportive. And the comment that, that 
and you could almost hear the sigh at the other end when they looked at what we'd sent this time, but they still very kindly came back and helped us sort things out, and we did appreciate it. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm just going to move on because I'm aware of the time and I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak. I've got one for uh, Jolene. Um, what was your experience with reflective practice and what advice would you give nurses who struggle with it as a newly registered nurse? So reflection is so important in nursing. I think we all know that. And there's so many different models and things that you can do and how to actually complete reflection um, well. My tip for someone who's struggling is if you're involved in a situation, if there's something that's making you kind of think about your practice, just get words on a paper, on a piece of paper. Just write down how you're feeling in that moment and then put it away. Come back to it at a different time because sometimes when we're going through situations that we are reflecting on, maybe they're difficult situations, it's maybe not that right, it's not the right time to kind of think about that too much maybe you just need to go home and try and um have some downtime yourself come back to it at a later time and see from fresh eyes whether your thoughts and your feelings have changed um what you've learned from that situation what you felt at the time do you still feel that way how has this experience influenced your practice so my big thing whenever i'm reflecting if something is happening whether it's good or bad i just get the words on the paper and I write how I'm feeling in that moment and then I put it away and then I make time to come back to it. I think one of the main things to do when you're a nurse is to make that time. Um, and I know in nursing it's very, very difficult, especially if you're on the front line, to make time on shift. So as I say in my book is I take myself out once a month for my coffee and a reflection. So I go and I, I take my little scraps of paper that I've had and I, I revisit those situations and I um, try and think about how I feel about that, how that's influenced my practice, how it's improved my practice, what I would do differently, but also to celebrate my successes. And, you know, I did well on that and I'm proud of myself. So I would just say, just get the words on the paper and make some time to come back to it and revisit how you felt and how things went. Don't put pressure on yourself. It's wonderful advice. Hopefully um, some of the participants will be able to take that on board as uh, newly registered nurses. Um, I have a question and I think this is going to be for Chris and for Joy. Um, in what ways has the essential skill set for nurses changed over the years? Do you want to take that one, Chris? Because I think we the changes were ongoing, weren't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think um, there's a core, a core set of skills that remain crucial for, for students to, to gain, but the evidence base is, um, has constantly evolved. Um, and certainly the essential skills, the previous editions before the, the revised book, um, you know, was was many years needed updating. So certainly there's a change in the evidence base, but also there's been changes in sort of nurse education. So that shift from, you know, an all graduate profession in the UK. So the expectations of students and newly qualified nurses are different. So it's not just the, the skills are still there, but it's actually almost like the surrounding parts that, um, that, that we've tried to include in the essential skills that makes it different. Um, and also around, you know, there is almost like that move to sort of, you know, having, you know, students to be able to do auscultation, to be prepared, to, you know, for cannulation, taking blood. So it's almost including that, not as almost seen as that's going to be when you're qualifying, almost thinking that's going to be part of the development, that step when you become a registered nurse. So it's, it, it's building on that core set, but also making sure it's very much responsive to sort of the healthcare system that we work in, where, you know, complexity of patients have changed. Um, so we're seeing much sicker patients in both the community and hospital setting. So it's about making sure that, you know, the registered nurses are able to do things like, you know, um, recognition of the deteriorating patient, be able to sort of link together skills and not just see it as almost like airway management is this, breathing is this, whatever oxygen therapy, but actually linking them together to help make that decision sometimes quite fast paced um, situations. So that's how we would say it's a different version from previous, it's built upon almost like what, we, what was there to reflect how the healthcare system and the expectations of, of students and newly qualified nurses are today. 
Anything you want to add, Joy? Okay. No, I think that's everything, because I think that that was the real reason for doing this. And with the new NMC standards and everything moving on, there was a book that didn't actually match what, what nurses were trying to do. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you both. Um, I've got one for uh, Kirsty. Uh, let me just bring that up. What do you think has changed recently to push integrated care up the agenda? Might not be one thing. <laughs> oh, there's been a a steady move towards more the need for more integrated systems, but I think that there's been lots of it, lots of different versions of integration through the years. I think whereas now what we're trying to approach and the way the health systems and health and social care systems across the world are trying to do is to look at whole systems approaches. The main the main rationale I would say for for the drive for integrate and by integrate care I mean integrate care as opposed to things like the integrate care systems in the UK um, is that our demographics are changing. We have older populations we have we know that people's healthy life expectancy in in some areas certainly in the UK is dropping into the 50s um, you look at Michael Marmot's work and people are becoming unwell at earlier ages through like predominantly lifestyle diseases um, and there's a lot more we need to do to prevent people getting ill and to shift our systems to look at health health and social care as a whole as part of society but also for us to look at community and place and the, the role that community and place leads to health. Um, you can't have healthy people in un unhealthy places. Uh, air pollution and um, traffic and lack of access to good food, lack of access to good housing are as vital to healthcare as anything we do within hospital settings. So we need to look at systems that are responsive and are able to sort of support communities to stay healthier for longer there is there's no doubt that there is um, the pressure on systems is and finances of healthcare systems is is probably a driving force for most <laughs> most healthcare from a governmental perspective um but i would i would like to say and i think what we try and do in the book is kind of put talk about integrate care as a part of how we support people, communities and places to be healthier and to maintain health for longer. If we can stop people developing type 2 diabetes at, early, at earlier and earlier ages, then the long term impact of them within the healthcare sector is vastly improved. But we can't do that at the point of, of diagnosis. We need to be starting a lot sooner, which means we need to think about systems. We also need to value our communities more and what our, our voluntary sector and our carers and our societies do towards health in their own right as well and how we work with them as partners um, and that takes quite a bit of shifting of power across the system as well so I've probably gone off on one I do tend to do this I'll just talk for ages so I'll, I'll stop there but I think hopefully I've answered your question thank you um, we've actually run out of time we're on the hour I suppose there were some other questions that were really interesting one for example was um, working closely with patients, so all of you as registered nurses, how do you think we can make healthcare more inclusive? But I think we can go on quite a lot about that. I don't know if anybody has any one-stop shop answers to it. Um, but if we don't, then uh, with all the questions, we'll make a note of them and then share it with our authors and then make responses back to everybody um, when we share the recording. So I, I just want to say finally thank you again to, to our authors um, for coming and joining us and talking about their books and thank you to everybody who also attended. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to, to our authors. So with that, I uh, just want to say thank you. Have a great afternoon, um, morning or evening, depending on where you are. I hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm.